regulation in energy started back, I suppose, uh, in Europe, certainly, in the late 1990s. Um, and the regulator traditionally has been the entity that set prices for, for consumers, I suppose, ultimately, but um, has had a fair influence in the development of markets as well, and, and many regulators, and ourselves as the regulator here in Ireland, are involved in designing electricity markets as well as regulating the prices in those markets. And it's quite important uh, that we understand the major changes that have happened from clean energy in its many, many forms. Um, and the changes in Europe have been fairly fundamental, um, and a fundamental effect on prices, um, have impacts on security of supply, and have a, had a number of, of uh, positive effects in many ways on, on consumers. What I was going to do in the first slide is maybe just describe how we as regulators sit um, within the, the broad context of various people uh, involved in policy development, how we impact on consumers, and also our, our relationship with industry. So the first slide you'll see here that I've brought up um, shows uh, some of these entities and how we engage and interact with them. I think, I think the key thing maybe that, that, that jumps out to people as and looking at this slide is that legislation is, the, is, is a key factor for us. So we are in a sense, and, and sometimes the word is called creatures of statute. We as regulators, our job is defined by the legislation. And this is uh, certainly at a European level, this is set by European legislation, by directives. And it's also set then by national legislation. And the exact role of regulators within different countries changes depending on the nature of that legislation. But we then have to take a set of decisions based on the legislation that we're given. And that legislation is often subject to challenge. So particularly if market participants uh, are not happy with the decision that we've taken, then they will take us to, to the court and they will challenge the decisions that we've taken. And I'll maybe give us an example. In Ireland, over the last couple of years, we've had one decision that went to the Supreme Court um, and a number of uh, decisions currently in the High Court at the moment. So legal challenges is, is part of something we have to be aware of when we, when we take our decisions. Now, the other thing that's quite important here in looking at this slide is to understand where does clean energy sit? Where are the objectives of clean energy uh, developed? Where are the targets? Where are the... the um, the standards generally for clean energy. And typically, they come from government policy. So if, if the governments are the ones who decide how much, uh, and governments here in this case would be the European Union uh, in Europe, but also then how that's translated in each member state. And they will set the level of, say, renewable energy. They will set how much energy efficiency needs to be delivered. Uh, they will set and um, have an impact on the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions also from the sector. Typically then, as, as the economic energy regulator, we need to have regard to the government policy and try and ensure that our policies and, and our rules that we set up aren't in conflict with the, with the government policy and don't frustrate the government policy, but the primary driver um, in terms of the, you know the, the level of support is is generally set by governments rather than set by economic regulators. Now, as we take uh, the legislation that we're given, as we work within the context of government policy, our primary duty is to consumers. We need to ensure that consumers um, are, are protected, that, that we we're looking after the consumer's interest. But we, as regulators, we don't generate energy, we don't transmit energy, we don't uh, supply energy, so we are reliant on the industry. Um, and it's particularly important that we can set up a stable framework for industry, because there's major investment. One of the features of energy markets generally are they're very capital intensive. Um, even a very small market like Ireland, we would typically have maybe three, four billion euro of, of um, uh, money will flow through the, the wholesale market and um, we'll have many billion invested in the, in the networks 
So th this is a very capital intensive industry um, in, in any country. And it's quite important that there's regulatory stability, that when, the, when investors from industry, when the capital markets who are, who are uh, providing the funds to industry, that, that they can have certainty that the regulator will take good decisions and that those decisions won't be subject to ad hoc or random change. So generally, uh, a good economic energy regulator will be independent from government in the sense that they won't be, uh, you know, taking decisions, they will take decisions on their own regard um, without uh, having to ask ministers or politicians whether they can take those decisions or not. And similarly, a good economic energy regulator will be independent from industry and not captured by industry and will be able to take decisions that are good for consumers rather than just good for, for industry requirements. So as you can see, overall, it, there's many things that need to be balanced by energy regulators. And as I go through this presentation, you'll see this issue of balance comes up again and again. So if I'll just run through then typical regulatory objectives, um, and this is, these are some of the objectives we have here in Ireland, but they're fairly typical uh, of regulators internationally. Um, often energy regulators, and, and we're an example of this, will not just be for, for the electricity sector, but also be for the gas sector. So in our case, um, our sort of primary objectives are to ensure that the lights stay on, so that there's security supply to a reasonable standard that the gas continues to flow, so again, that there's a, a, a high, um, high resilience and, and a high probability uh, of people being able to have confidence that they will get uh, both electricity and gas supply. The third, which is obviously in tension with the first two, is that we ensure that prices are fair and reasonable. And it's probably fair to say, probably worldwide, but certainly in Europe, uh, it has been a difficult time for consumers. Um, given uh, the economic downturn in the economies, that energy prices have typically risen uh, relative to people's income quite significantly over the last, say, five years. And that there's a, the, the challenge has always been there to ensure that prices are fair and reasonable, but that challenge is a growing challenge at the moment. And if I take Ireland as an example, there's something like 10% of consumers who are struggling to pay their bills at the moment, um, and actually in arrears in some form or other. Um, and I think that's not atypical. It's difficult for many consumers. So we have to ensure that industry can make investments, that they can make those investments efficiently, um, and that we try and use price controls, we try and use competition where possible to ensure that those prices are as, as low as, as, as reasonable. The, the fourth point here is that there's a significant number of constraints from a policy perspective and also from various forms of legislation to ensure we comply with a growing set of environmental uh, policy objectives and also environmental laws. So some of these relate to ensuring that greenhouse gases are, uh, are reduced, that renewable energy is used significantly. Some of them may also relate to um, biodiversity, uh, making sure that you know various investments consider the, the local environment as well as the, the global environment. And the fifth point is as regulators we try and do our job uh, in line with best international practice. Um, part of this is to ensure that our own costs uh, and our own efficiency is as good as possible. Part of it is also as protection um, against legal challenge. Uh, typically, legal challenges against regulators are more on issues of process as much as they are on, on issues of substance. Moving to the next slide then, um, this is uh, in a sense somewhat similar to the previous slide in the sense that these are the three, often called the energy trilemma, the three different elements that we're trying to balance as regulators. Um, if we can see if we take, for example, on price, a significant difference here between the US uh, and Europe, um, and much of this has been driven by the availability of resource. The advent of shale gas in the US has meant a, a fairly significant reduction overall in energy prices to consumers. It's also uh, driven some interesting changes in consumption, with a lot more use of gas. Um, a lot less use of coal, and I'll come back to that later in, in, in some of the effects that's having here in Europe. 
Um, in terms of security, uh, generally, and again, clean energy is having a big effect here, that the, 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 for conventional generators, and these would be typical, typically gas generators, there's been a significant reduction in the profitability of, of gas generators. And this, uh, there's been a significant increase in the number of, of renewable generators, often on the basis of subsidies that are, that are available. And that this has driven um, a, a difficulty in terms of security supply, a growing difficulty. Uh, an example of this would be um, the closure of the nuclear plants in, in Germany, which was purely a, a policy issue. It resulted in something like eight gigawatts of capacity being removed from the European system. But since then, as a result of changes in the wholesale markets, there's been something like 50 gigawatts of gas fire generation have been removed from the market because of poor profitability. So at some point, this will raise a security supply issue. Um, and this is something, for, from a regulatory point of view, we'll need to be particularly careful about. Um, the third one, then, on the environment, Environmental policy is not always as clear as it might be in some ways. And if we take again Europe, we have three um, interventions by, by, European, uh, by the European uh, Commission um, and, and also then as implemented in each member state. We have a renewable energy target, um, typically at the, across Europe this is 20%. We have a carbon market, the, the European trading system. Uh, Scheme and the European Trading Scheme has uh, the price in that has significantly reduced now over the last five years, and started off at relatively high prices of something like 25 euro a ton, and we're now down to think something like three, four euro a ton. I think the latest figures I've seen. And and the third element of environmental policy in this area is energy efficiency, and again a discussion about a 20% reduction in, in energy efficiency. And it's not clear, and there's a debate going on at a European level um, in terms of what needs to be done next. How will these targets move forward beyond 2020? Because the targets aren't necessarily particularly coherent, um, and this poses challenges for us um, as, uh, as regulators in trying to implement uh, markets and regulation that, that tries to resolve this energy trilemma in a, in a reasonable manner. So what I'll try and do in this presentation is run through the impact of clean energy in, I suppose, the whole, all parts of the energy sector. And I've, I've broken the energy sector down into four main constituent parts. The wholesale market, uh, the transmission system, the distribution system, and typically a distribution system in voltage terms would be sort of 110 kilovolts and below, and then the retail market. Um, uh, at, at the point that it, uh, it delivers to, to the consumer. Let me just talk briefly by way of background on the wholesale market in terms of uh, this slide you can see the renewable energy targets across Europe for 2020. And this is uh, renewable electricity targets, so the, the level of renewables in the electricity markets. And I think it's probably fair to say that the electricity markets have more onerous renewable targets than, than, than elsewhere. Um, you'll see in Ireland and in a number of countries uh, what the form of renewable electricity is, is quite significant. So if, if I compare and contrast, say, Ireland at 40% and Austria at 71%, obviously Austria has a lot more renewable energy um, by, in comparison to Ireland in its target. But when you look at the level of <coughs> um, controllable renewable energy versus non-controllable renewable energy. In Austria, a lot of it is uh, hydroelectric, which is very controllable um, and uh, much easier to integrate into an electricity system, whereas in Ireland, the 37% is mainly wind, which is highly variable and, uh, and is not that um, predictable um, beyond, say, a week. It's very difficult to say what level of of wind energy they'll be in the country in, in, in a month, never mind a year's time. So that, that variability adds uh, further challenges to the system. I'll also talk briefly then about the impact of price. And what we have here in this slide is the variation in the levels of the support provided to renewables across various countries in Europe. And as you can see, 
it changes significantly per technology. And I think you'll see that the high spikes in this relate particularly to solar photovoltaic. Um, but also, a very, there's significant variation from one country to another. So to date, renewable targets and renewable policy has delivered a, a, a quite a varied set of uh, interventions by governments. Um, and there's a, a debate going on at a European level, certainly, about whether this is sustainable and whether there needs to be further integration and uh, a more holistic renewable uh, support across Europe rather than a sense, perhaps, of, of every country doing its own thing. To talk about the wholesale market, um, what I was going to, hope to do here was explain the, the big project that's ongoing and has been ongoing now for the last um, probably four or five years in Europe of trying to integrate wholesale, uh, wholesale markets. Now, this will be both uh, electricity and gas, although I'll focus mainly on electricity uh, from a renewable perspective. Uh, this, uh, this driver to have a single electricity market has been one of the areas where uh, there's been a, a general consensus uh, across various member states in Europe uh, in terms of trying to achieve uh, better integration uh, of, of many functions. And there's been a, a strong focus on energy in this. The process has typically to start with a, a European directive. The European directive then has been given to a new body that's been set up called ACER that's a conglomeration of all the European energy regulators. Um, and we sit together uh, on a board of regulators and take decisions collectively. And those decisions in terms of bringing the, the wholesale markets together have been in the form of uh, documents called framework guidelines. And these framework guidelines set out the common rules and common processes to be applied right across Europe. Uh, the framework guidelines are then given to the system operators. And there's a pan-European system operator agency called ENSO-E for electricity and ENSO-G for gas. And those two entities have then translated the framework guidelines from the regulators into a set of network codes. The network codes then, after going through and getting final approval from regulators and from the European Commission, are then translated into binding European legislation. And those sets of network codes are driving the major changes in, in the wholesale markets and the integration of wholesale markets across Europe. Typically, uh, if we go back in history uh, at a European level, there has been interconnectors um, between various member states, but those interconnectors haven't been particularly well used um, and haven't necessarily always reflected what one might expect from the underlying markets. And I'll talk a little bit more about these uneconomic flows and what's been done to try and, to try and solve those. So, Part of the driver for the internal market was to, to try and uh, minimize uh, the distortions across the member states and to make sure that there was the most efficient use of, of the interconnectors. The, the legislative packages uh, that underpinned this process started off with the, the first and second um, sets of directives. And these are the ones that, that set up the original uh, economic regulators. They also separated out the network companies, which were monopoly functions, from the various market participants. Um, and, but the, probably fair to say that the biggest changes uh, to indus from an industry perspective and probably from a regulatory perspective have come from the third package or the, th uh, the, the third uh, series of directives on, on energy for, uh, uh, at a European level. So they established, as I mentioned, ACER, which is the um, pan-European uh, group of regulators. Um, they would also set, uh, established ENSOE, and as I mentioned, ENSOG on the gas. Uh, and the, uh, improving cross-border um, investment, as well as cross-border use of interconnectors, was obviously a, a, a key issue. The target date um, for 
for ensuring that all of this has been delivered was 2014. There's been a number of small exceptions. Um, Ireland has, has been one of them because of the, the, the different nature of our market here. But by the end of 2014, uh, all of Europe should be uh, integrated uh, in terms of the wholesale market. And this should minimize the distortion of trade between the, the, the various member states. I've got a series now of little um, maps to show the, the evolution of, the, of this change. Uh, the, as you can see, uh, this first slide is from the year 2000. And the market integration in 2000 was extremely limited. Um, so there was some basic rules about regulation, but there was very limited uh, interaction between various member states. Uh, Nordpool was probably the only exception. Um, and again, I, I think we, there was some, uh, I mentioned earlier about the, 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 the usefulness of, of hydropower in electricity systems. And I think the use of hydro in Nordpool was a particular driver to ensuring early integration of the, uh, the markets in Norway, Sweden, and Finland. Uh, w we have a a committee here in Ireland that takes, takes decisions on an all-island basis and the, one of the, the members of that is actually from Norway um, and he was explaining to us that the, the initial thoughts and the initial work on Nordpool started back as early as 1974. So there's been a long history in Nordpool and I think there's been a general recognition at a European level of, of many of the benefits of, of that, that have been delivered uh, in the Scandinavian markets. The next slide then shows the uh, market integration in 2006. So you can see now at this point there is some level of integration, particularly around France and the Benelux countries, um, and in s some improvement of, of cross-border trade there. And then this next slide after that now uh, brings us uh, up to 2010. And as you can see by 2010, there's been a significant improvement um, in the integration of, of, of wholesale markets. Um, so Germany, uh, the Austrians, quite a few new people have joined. And this is now a significant market with a, a significant volume of trade. Uh, then if I just flow through then into 2014, and this is what's expected to have been achieved by the end of next year. The euro pool or the a common uh, system um, uh, across Europe will be pretty much implemented. Ireland um, and uh, some of the, the Balkan states uh, have yet to follow, but uh, pretty much across Europe there will be um, close coupling of, of the wholesale markets. The one thing it's probably worth mentioning, um, I'll just finish off with the last slide on that before I, I mention it. Just in 2016, then, you'll see Ireland and some further Balkan states uh, also joining. The, the use of market coupling and the importance of market coupling has been made particularly relevant given the, the volume of clean energy in, in European markets. So between the extensive use of wind energy, at the moment we're about 20% wind energy are implemented in the Irish market. Uh, I know the Spanish market, the German market, uh, the Italian market would have higher levels of renewables, which is a mixture of wind and photovoltaic. And that because of the variability of this resource, we end up with fairly significant flows between member states. And maybe if I take Germany as, a, as an example, so if there's a sudden change in the, the solar power available in Germany, it results in very significant flows of energy through neighboring countries, through France, through Poland. And this is quite a, a challenge for the system operators in those neighboring countries to ensure that they can accommodate those flows. And it's been part of a driver for discussions uh, in terms of wholesale markets and ensuring that not just is there efficient trade, but also that there's some new mechanisms like flexibility that will encourage the types of generators needed to fill in the gaps when the renewable energy is not available. So just to talk a little bit more about market design, and I'm focusing here quite a bit on market design because it is a major factor in terms of 
the investment climate for clean energy generally uh, and, and for all investment. The Irish market is different to most of the European market in that we've something somewhat more akin to the US market based on a centralized pool. It's all generators must bid into the pool. The generators typically set the pool price and the suppliers then all purchase from the pool and will typically then uh, be, be takers of that pool price. Demand side uh, can also participate in a pool and typically uh, there'll be a series of either bilateral or financial contracts between generators and suppliers to hedge against pool volatility. In, in the bilaterals market, there's direct contracts between suppliers and producers and only where there are imbalances then in those uh, contracts is there a balancing mechanism and the, uh, the uh, whatever is left over in terms of surplus or deficit in energy is purchased or sold in the balancing market. So this is the, the cornerstone of, of how the wholesale markets work. And the differences in these various mechanisms is, is quite significant. Typically, if we look at this in terms of timelines, there's a, the, the market looks at a, a day ahead. The, the day ahead is, is probably the most volume is traded in the day ahead or is expected to trade in the, in the new markets in the day ahead basis. But what's, what's not traded in the day ahead is left over then to the intraday market. And then once that intraday market typically will run till about an hour before real time. And then the, it's, the system then is run by the, the system operators and there's a balancing market then to ensure that the, the, the real time par uh, is facilitated. On top of this, there are also a set of ancillary services that ensure that the various technical requirements from system operators are met. And the interaction of these can be is, is quite a complex process, and there's been a lot of debate um, and still some areas to be resolved at a European level. So there's still a, a, a fair bit of work, probably not so much on the day ahead and more in the intraday and balancing markets. But Given the variability of, of wind and the variability of solar, um, the, the intraday and balancing markets are, are, are a significant issue um, and do also impact on the risk seen by market participants as they try to invest in, in these markets. There's a, a, a set of rules, and I won't go through too much detail here on the rules, but there's a, there's a set of rules for auctions uh, in terms of allocation. Uh, of how the cross-border capacity uh, is um, shared out uh, across market participants uh, on a market basis. Um, it's true to say also that there's a fair amount of risk, and you'll see that the main focus here is cross-border, and I think this is typical at a European level, that the market is really all about improving cross-border trade and doesn't say that much about the, the specific design in, in individual markets. There's a, a number of different mechanisms. There's physical transmission rights and financial transmission rights. The UIOSI is a, is a European rule, which is use it or sell it, so that people can't hoard capacity and therefore reduce the, the volume of trade between various member states. Um, and there is some discussion about uh, hedging tools the, um, to ensure that there's sufficient li liquidity or enough people buying and selling in, in the markets. Um, I'll skip through some of these slides. Some of these are, are sort of just typical uh, supply-demand curves to show that where there's a difference between the two curves, between two markets, um, this is done uh, through these implicit auctions. There's a quite a complicated formula called Euphema uh, that works this out. And this common formula or algorithm um, applies right away across the, the various member states. Um, and is the basis then for the, the coupling between the various markets. Uh, I'll skip through that again. It's just to show that there will always still be a price difference. If there's a congestion between two markets and there's insufficient transmission capacity, you will still get different prices in different markets. So this integration of wholesale markets across Europe doesn't mean that there'll be a single price across Europe. It just reduces the price differentials. But where there is any... Uh, transmission constraint, and there are significant across Europe, there will still be price differences driven by the level of constraint. 
these graphs are sort of an interesting graph. This is um, prior to the implementation of the, these algorithms. You can see the, these individual dots or various trades. And it, it's been clear before these algorithms have been applied that there are quite a few um, what would seem as not economically optimal trades where people are doing various trades um, bilaterally. Um, and the next slide then shows once you apply this, these algorithms, there's, a, there's a, a perfect alignment and a much more efficient use then of the interconnectors as a result. Um, and this, this is the, 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 the primary objective of, of the coupling of the, of the various markets across Europe. Now, I'll just talk beyond the, 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 the coupling mechanism. There's a significant debate still ongoing at the moment in Europe about the type of wholesale markets. Is energy uh, alone sufficient or do we need other elements? Now, in an energy-only market, the principle is that capacity or the need for new generation is driven by shortages, and at the times of shortages, then, there are extremely high prices, and that those high prices then are attracting new generation. The debate that's ongoing, and there's a fair diversity of opinion uh, at the moment at a European level, is on whether there should be a capacity mechanism. Now, a capacity mechanism works to effectively provide an insurance hedge against these high prices. So there's a payment to market partition participants generally uh, for capacity, and that this will then remunerate them for their investment, and they don't have to wait until there's a high price or a high spike in the market. In theory, it should deliver the same result as an energy-only market. In practice, uh, uh, market participants often have more confidence in a capacity mechanism in that there's a concern that either regulators or governments will intervene at times of very high prices uh, to reduce those prices and therefore take away the investment signal. Um, and this is sometimes called the, the, the missing money problem, although the missing money problem uh, has a number of definitions. The, the impact of, of uh, renewable electricity has had a particular uh, resonance here for capacity mechanisms with more and more renewables on the system and where the renewable energy is being paid for by direct subsidies rather than being paid for by revenue in the wholesale markets, this has tended to uh, suppress or reduce wholesale prices. Now, from a consumer point of view, this is great, but for the long-term security, we need to ensure that there's sufficient long-term capacity in the market be it renewable capacity or other capacity. And this is not this conventional generation capacity. This might be storage capacity. It might be demand-side uh, management uh, and paying for the capacity there. But the various forms of capacity need some form of remuneration. Um, and there's a concern that currently um, that, that, that this impact of renewable energy is possibly not sustainable. And there's some discussion about introducing further mechanisms, not just for capacity, but also for flexibility. So this is a, a, an area of um, significant debate, uh, ongoing debate at the moment. And I, I'll just leave you with this slide on the, on the wholesale market. And this is a question, and there's some debate at a European level to say, we really should move away from renewable support. Renewable support was only there for new technologies. Um, these technologies are not mature, so there's no need to have individual subsidies for them. There are some challenges to that thinking, um, particularly in an energy-only market that are, that's driven by marginal cost. So typically in these markets, it's the, the most expensive generator needed to meet demand is the one that sets the price, um, and that all the other generators then can make a rent on that in the market. With renewable generators, typically, and again, it's not, it's not an absolute rule, but it's fairly typical that for wind or solar PV, it's all about the upfront capital cost. And those capital costs are, are generally high compared to alternative options. But it's extremely low running cost. You don't have to pay for the wind. You don't have to pay for the sun. And the, the, the general maintenance costs are, are typically quite low for, for renewable energy. So this high capex and low opex doesn't naturally fit with a market which is driven by marginal cost. The marginal cost market works fine for, say, gas-fired generators that are trying to recover a significant operating cost, 
But when when there's this upfront capital cost, people are seeking to get a return on it. Uh, it's not easy to do with with the current market design. Um, also, because of the, the the capital cost, the cost of raising finance is a significant determinant as well. So, it's important to try and de-risk or reduce the risk in these markets in order to get the cost of capital down from the from the capital markets, as there's a significant reduction then in the overall cost to consumer. So, it's very important that there's and these again are 20-year investments, 25-year investments. So regulatory certainty and policy certainty are, are, are key in ensuring that, um, you know, that, that there's a sustainable investment in, in these various technologies. It's not clear what the answer is yet in this. And I think, again, this is a very active debate at the moment in Europe, particularly as, as we get closer to 2020 and people start to think about what will happen next uh, post-2020. Um, but I just wanted to share some of your, the, our, our, the current thinking in that area. Now, the next area to talk about, and sorry, the one other thing I might just say before I finish on that is there's other factors that are causing distortions in, and dysfunction in, in wholesale markets. I mentioned at the beginning about the differential between US and European prices. Uh, there's a lot of cheap coal coming into Europe as a result of not being able to find uh, home in its natural market in the US. So for the first time uh, uh, for many years, coal fire generation is now at a significant uh, commercial advantage. Part of this is the cheap coal. Part of this is the extremely low carbon price that I mentioned earlier on um, in the European trading scheme. So we're ending up with coal fire generation actually being able to make some profit in the market where gas-fired plant cannot. So the coal-fired plants obviously have much higher emissions, um, and this is creating a, a sort of a perversity in the market generally where, yes, we're getting renewables in, but at a relatively high cost to consumers, but w some of the benefits to the emissions are being offset by a significant increase in the use of coal and reduction in the use of gas. Um, to this state, it has come to the point now where there's actually talk of building new coal-fired generation, particularly in Germany, and, and that looks uh, at, at, a, at a macro level as a, as a fairly inconsistent energy policy. And particularly at a, if we look at it at a macro level where we have significant reductions in emissions in the US um, and significant reductions in price, whereas at a, a, at a European level there's been a very significant increase in emissions because of more coal being used and yet an increase in overall price to consumers. The, the corollary to that is the, the reduction in gas demand has created uh, or is beginning to create challenges for the the recovery of, of fixed network costs and uh, you know the ensuring that there's adequate investment in in the gas sector. So even though the gas is seen as a low, relatively low carbon fuel compared to other car, or rather other fossil fuels, um, it's 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 losing out generally in the market moment. Uh, there's been something like a 6% reduction in gas demand over the last couple of years in Europe. Um, we in Ireland have seen that uh, in advance of 10% reductions in gas demand. Um, and this is, you know, this is driving uh, challenges. There's also uh, a question about the investment. Typically, investors are looking at the utilities um, and, and bring, breaking them into two types of companies. The good utility where there's regulated returns in network assets and the bad utilities where they're, where they're the, in the competitive sector. Um, there's also the question of, of nuclear support and cost competitiveness. A lot of large industry now leaving Europe and move, moving to countries like the US, and I think that's questioning um, policy decisions, uh, uh, particularly for the future. So look, I've spent quite a bit of time there in the wholesale market. I'll maybe just canter through more quickly the transmission system. Um, I'll just give as an example here the Irish transmission system. Um, a lot of the renewable energy in Ireland is, is wind energy, uh, the, wind, the highest wind resources on the west coast, but the highest demand is on the east coast. So this is driving uh, the need for a lot more um, investment in networks. I think in Germany, the, sort of a lot of the renewables in the north, a lot of demand in the south. So the, you know this is a common problem across Europe. 
And, and one thing maybe to say in this is that this is there's a lot of public protest now. Everyone believes that renewable energy is a good thing, but when it means pylons near their home, they feel very differently about it. And there's been quite an active and well orchestrated um, uh, pushback from from the general public uh, on, on on renewable uh, renewable to some extent, but but the transmission assets. Uh, associated with renewable energy uh, in, in particular. One of the issues that we've seen in Ireland, we've set up a project called the DS3 project, and this is really to do with ensuring that the operation of the system is uh, secure and sustainable. Uh, we've had to implement a number of new types of products to ensure that there's sufficient flexibility in the system. And I, I won't go through too much of the detail here, uh, there's, there's quite a bit on our website, on the CER website, um, and this is an area of, of active debate at a European level. How do we operate uh, systems with such a large amount of variability? And it's causing fairly fundamental changes in the traditional uh, approaches taken by system operators. Uh, demand side is, is part of that as well. Um, one of the, the key factors in this has been uh, the volume of wind instantaneously. So I mentioned earlier on that there's 20% of energy in Ireland from renewable resources, but at the moment there's a limit of 50% instantaneous uh, uh, energy that can be taken from wind. And this is this 50% SNSP uh, factor here on the graph. So at the moment we can run up to 50% um, uh, of wind and imports on the system, but uh, uh, which sets the overall demand. But beyond that, then the system becomes unstable. This DS3 project will then move us up by 2020 to a 75%, and it's requiring fairly significant changes in the system operation. Beyond the 75%, we don't think it will be possible to, to operate uh, uh, until after 2020 at the earliest, based on our experience of going to 75%. Let me talk a little bit also about the distribution system. Um, there's been a lot of changes to the distribution system, and the distribution system operator's role is quite different now to what it has been. A lot of the, the renewable energy uh, that's been delivered is embedded, so it's micro-generation, it's photovoltaic on people's homes, it's small-scale wind. Um, also, there's been new technologies in terms of the deployment of uh, electrification in, in transportation sectors, um, electric vehicles being a, a key example of that. There's been a, a, a rollout of smart metering. Um, we're in the process of designing ours here in Ireland at the moment. Um, the Italians were the first in Europe to, to have smart metering, but there's quite a few countries now across Europe who are implementing smart metering. And the associated smart grids uh, and uh, new ways of operating the grid. There's clearly a need for, for more demand side participation, and particularly given the need for further flexibility. This is an area of, 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 of a lot of activity. And part of this ancillary services I mentioned earlier on is ensuring that there's sufficient flexibility in the system. So these changes are driving um, an, a, 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 the need for a different approach to the way that we regulate the, the system operators. So we're looking, and we're, we're, this is very topical at the moment for us uh, as we move forward beyond 2014. And we have a group of regulators now looking specifically at how we change distribution tariffs, how we try and encourage the traditional monopoly utilities to promote innovation in the sector generally, um, and allow new players to provide new services. Um, it, it's also uh, causing us to question what, it, you know, take example of, of electric vehicles, is it the role of the system operator to facilitate the charging of electric vehicles and to what extent should they be involved in that process? And that's causing us to, to redefine the, the, the system operator functions generally. Um, this flows through into how we set their revenues through price controls, how we change their incentives. There's also, because of particularly smart metering, a large increase in the volume of data available from system operators. And this is driving the, the possibility of a large number of new and interesting products, but also raising a, a, a lot of concerns about consumer protection and consumer data concerns. So there is a, an active debate at the moment about what role the distribution system operator should have and how much 
um, further change might be needed. Uh, some debate even of a, a fourth package um, of, of European legislation needed around this, although there's certainly no, um, no consensus on that at this stage. And then finally, maybe just to talk about the, the retail market, because you know, while I focus a lot in this call on the wholesale market, the retail market uh, is seeing significant level of change as well, and green energy is again at the heart of that. There's been a lot of talk about green tariffs, um, and there's certainly facilitation of green tariffs in, in the terms of the types of um, labelling uh, that are available in bills and being, allowing customers to see where the, the energy that they're purchasing has come from. Um, we haven't seen maybe as much pickup as, as we might have expected in, in, in people who will only buy from, from green sources. In, interestingly, in some ways, that's as much uh, uh, an issue for business as it is for consumers, as people are trying to show that they're good corporate citizens and, and using um, clean energy as part of their energy delivery. We're seeing um, changes in consumption, uh, and we need to probably promote further changes in consumption. So while there's been the downturn in the economy has overall, I mean, for the Irish economy, we've seen something like a 10% reduction in energy demand, um, and I know Obviously, energy efficiency will will have positive uh, impacts on on um, overall consumption generally. But it, it's important that we try and help the the consumer participate in effectively some elements of the wholesale market and can see some of the uh, the, the benefits of of renewable energy on the system. For example, in a number of markets, the Irish market, the German market, the UK market, uh, quite a few markets across Europe. We've seen zero wholesale prices and sometimes even negative prices as a result of large amounts of renewable energy trying to connect to the system. Now, at the moment, the consumer can't access any of that. The consumer can't actually uh, tap in and get paid to consume energy at those times. Um, part of the idea of smart meters is to facilitate some of that engagement. I think it'll, it, it's going to be difficult uh, in the sense that we need to ensure, and this is my fifth bullet point here, that we don't um, provide lots more choice to the consumer, but also c uh, cause confusion for the consumer. So we'll need to try and ensure that we can promote competition and uh, promote a lot more engagement by the consumer, but not completely confuse them with the, the level of information that we're getting. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier on in terms of the, syst the um, system operator about electric vehicle integration. Obviously, there's a, a direct impact for consumer here. And again, to try and make that consumer experience um, as, as positive as possible. So maybe just to conclude, uh, I'll probably run on more than the, uh, initially intended, but maybe just to, to sort of conclude overall that regulatory change is needed um, and w uh, as a result of policy decisions to, to promote green uh, energy generally. Um, that, that this comes in each of the various areas we just discussed today, um, in the wholesale market evolution and the changes we need to see in the wholesale market, um, particularly if we're going to move away from a, a process where, where those policy decisions are always underpinned purely by subsidies. We're going to try, have to have a significant ramp up in the investments needed in, in transmission capacity across Europe. And I think we're going to be challenged in trying to do that in a way that doesn't raise the public's ire um, and can be done um, without massively increasing overall costs to the consumer as well. Um, there's a lot of pressure in Ireland and in many countries to move transmission lines underground, um, but typically this has a much higher cost um, and also has l lower benefits in terms of the, the system operation constraints that the underground has versus overground. Um, but that's a, a very active and growing debate. We talked about the, the, the need for a new role for the distribution system operator, and again, a lot of active engagement with that. And finally, and not least, um, is to ensure that the consumer can um, doesn't get overloaded um, with, the, with the volume of change that's ongoing in the energy system and that we can truly get the consumer to play their part and be part of the solution and not feel that they've had a, a problem imposed on them with all this change. So on that note, I, I'd like to finish up uh, and thanks everyone for, for listening to the process. Hopefully it was, it was useful. Okay, thank you very much, Garrett.
um, really interesting pre presentation, very comprehensive. And uh, being myself a former employee of uh, French Energy Regulatory Commission, I'm I'm really happy to to have followed this uh, this great presentation. Excellent. So um, now I would invite our audience to submit uh, submit uh, their questions. Um, meanwhile, I have um, I have a few a few of them on my side. Uh, meanwhile, we can uh, provide some some time to the audience to submit questions. So uh, my first question, Garrett, would be about the capacity markets. So basically, uh, I understand that this this would, how how the question is how this capacity market trans, uh, is. Um, paid by consumers. So should consumers expect a higher fixed term, uh, well, the grid access term, in their electricity bills? Yes, a good question, Fernando. Um, the, the capacity markets, uh, actually, where we stand at the moment, if you, if you remember the, the slide where I showed you, there's very few capacity markets at the moment in Europe. I think Ireland the few areas where we have a, a capacity market. Um, the, in, the, in the Irish market, we constrain the bidding in the wholesale market so that people can only bid in their short run cost, which is typically their fuel cost and, and, and some mm -hmm. variable operational maintenance costs. Um, so that the, 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 there would never be full recovery uh, in the energy market, but the way we've constrained the energy market so the argument is that the consumer doesn't pay more, but they pay a separate capacity mechanism. Hopefully, it should mean that the consumer ends up paying probably slightly more when there's more capacity and slightly less when there's a shortage of capacity so that it, it evens out the prices seen by consumers. But it shouldn't, in theory, mean that the consumer has to pay more. Now, this is a, a heavily debated issue at the moment, and the European Commission have come out with a, a, a recent um, discussion document, um, and they're not necessarily convinced that there's a need for capacity markets. But there is active consideration of capacity in the in the UK market, uh, in the French market, in the Italian market. There's some discussion in the German market at the moment. So they, they, there's also um, uh, some form of capacity in the Spanish market. And there was in the Portuguese market, but I think it was removed by the Troika as part of their bailout provisions. So that there's, you, you know, it's it's one of the, the, the topics that, uh, that uh, has the most active debate uh, among regulators when, when we meet. And once we start talking about capacity, it gets a fairly heated discussion, a good animated discussion when we raise the issue of capacity. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, a bit more on the same note. Uh, following this um, this capacity uh, market, uh, we could uh, because well you you pointed out we we find the wholesale markets uh, delivering zero or even negative prices. Um, I've seen some presentations from a transmission system operator in Germany expecting uh, a few thousand hours in a year with negative prices. And um, well, the point is that indeed we have a lot of installed capacity that needs to be uh, remunerated. But at the same time, when uh, the wind blows, uh, we risk having negative prices for energy. So it seems that indeed we need a, a change of model to, to, to some extent. Um, my, my question is whether with uh, lowering uh, energy prices, uh, we are missing uh, incentives for energy efficiency. And, um, and another point is, uh, if these capacity markets uh, go ahead and uh, we head to um, bigger fixed term uh, electricity bills, we could expect a uh, clear incentive for demand side management. So the point is how demand side man how to address demand side management and uh, how to address energy efficiency in the perspective of ca capacity markets. 
Another good question, Fernando. The the energy efficiency uh, is is interesting. I, I think one of the the difficulties in energy efficiency to date has just been a, a very uh, simplistic. Let's use less energy. But when you look at the, there's a lot of opportunity to not necessarily use significantly less, but to use energy at times when both the prices are low, but also the environmental impact is low. So these times of low prices are also the times of, of low emissions. So we're seeing a system in the Irish market, and, and I think it's, it's similar amongst other European markets, that at some times, because of this 50% limit that we have in the system, we have to turn off renewable generators even though the wind is blowing. So the, the renewable generator is there, the wind is blowing, but we have to turn it off because we can't facilitate it in the system. If we could increase demand at those times and therefore reduce demand at other times, this would have a significant benefit to all users in the system as well as the user who's accessing it at that time. So this is where I think smart meters come in and, and this is particularly interesting in the context of trying to have more innovation uh, in the market. In order to do it properly though, we need to have dynamic tariffs. So we need the price that's seen by the consumer as we ultimately being as close as possible to the wholesale price. Mm -hmm. um, this is a challenge. I think that the big challenge here is to ensure that the consumer isn't swamped with large volumes of data. I think we need to be realistic. Is, is the consumer really going to have a look at the wholesale price before they decide to turn the kettle on or to do the washing? And possibly the answer in this is, is innovation in terms of automation. You know, can, can simple algorithms be built into equipment? Um, I know there's been some work here in the Irish market at looking at storage heaters that would have uh, more sophisticated controls and, and better storage capacity. Um, certainly EV charging, again, would be another area where this would be particularly useful. So part of, I think, what's necessary is to try and get more accurate but hopefully not confusing signals to the consumer that they can see some of these things that are happening on the system and that they have the opportunity to respond um, it, through automation or through some processes that will allow them to access these lower costs and yet also provide uh, energy efficiency benefits. Okay, good. Very interesting. Um, great. Um, so just another question. Um, do you have any um, experience in Ireland or elsewhere about industrial flexibility being considered and deployed? Uh, do you know any innovative uh, remuneration scheme? I don't know whether this can link to capacity markets as well. Yeah, I mean, one thing it's, it's worth saying, and certainly the Irish market capacity is paid to demand side flexibility on the same basis as generation capacity and I think that's an important uh, important mm -hmm. factor to make sure the capacity works properly so whether the capacity is the capacity to turn off or to turn on I, I, I think that that they, they both have to be equally remunerated it's also interesting to note that this flexibility on the electricity system is also a flexibility on the gas system because of the variability of gas generation as it swings to fill in the troughs when the renewable generator isn't available, we need, as a result, a lot more uh, flexibility in gas as well as electricity. The difficulty with industry is that I, I think a lot of those, what, what Mike would call the low-hanging fruit or the easy flexibility options, have already been adopted by industry, you know, fr from an historic point of view. You know, the industry has been well aware of this and are, are typically a very... Uh, well-informed user, so that they, if, if they have flexibility in the system, quite often it's used, uh, it's used up already, um, and I think you know it will take some very major uh, innovative processes at the time of the design of the process. So if we can get some of these markets better understood, maybe at the time that people are doing their design for industrial processes, that they can include it at that point rather than an afterthought once the things have been designed and built. Okay, so do you, do you see room for, um, let's say, European initiative to, well, to promote and to get uh, as much as possible from existing flexibility in industrial processes? Yeah, I, I, my, my own sense is that really people will follow the money. So if the wholesale <laughs> markets are being designed properly, 
that's the incentive and the best incentive. You know, providing R&D funding and all these other good things are, are helpful to, to prove, you know, sort of for, for leaders. But in terms of delivering overall policy, really the underlying market should do that. And people, it's difficult to argue that people should do things other than what the market tells them to do. Okay, so this is quite a regulatory issue at this at this stage, I understand. Probably, probably. Although market design is not always a regulatory issue, some member states like to do that themselves. So it, it depends again on the legislation and the, and the policy mm -hmm. making. Mm -hmm. Good. So we have another question. Uh, so the, the question is, uh, what's your top recommendation worth of advice uh, to assist regulators with with successfully meeting challenges around renewables integration tariffs? That they, are, that they face as the clean energy markets and technology deployment increase. So, top recommendation? <laughs> okay, a, a tough question from Vicky. Uh, I'm not sure I can say a top recommendation. I think certainly one of the challenges we as regulators face always uh, in trying to regulate an industry is that we're relatively small organizations. We have a, a relatively constrained resource compared to the industries that we're regulating. So there's this is always this asymmetry of information. It's difficult for us to get as much accurate information uh, as the industries that we regulate. So anything that helps us do that, anything that helps us understand and uh, be able to see and challenge as opposed to the industries. So the more you know, good work that's done by various agencies um, focused on trying to resolve some of these issues, and the more they can share that with regulators, I, I think it is very helpful. So I, I think the top recommendation would be to try and get better, more reliable information to regulators in the right form, is my suggestion. Okay, excellent. So we would be happy uh, bringing our small contribution in this effort. And uh, once again, uh, uh, you're very welcome for making it happen. Um, maybe last question and then it's time to adjourn. Um, this is a question relative to market coupling. So basically whether uh, coupling a gross pool market with a bilateral based market, uh, whether the day head markets have, uh, well, comparable, well, they don't have comparable uh, volumes to trade. So whether this, this, this is something feasible. Um, be made. Again, Fernando, uh, an interesting question. This, this is one of the challenges that we are facing in, in the Irish market particularly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think it's impossible, but it is it is more difficult. Um, one of the benefits though, I'll say, uh, uh, you know, in, in support of, of gross pool markets is that they can typically deliver a lot more liquidity and transparency. So it's much, it's, it can be quite helpful in terms of people understanding what's happening in the wholesale market. Um, we're looking at this at the moment. We're, we're working through it. I, I think part of it is the type of bids that are made in the wholesale market. Um, w one of the challenges we have in the Irish market is we have what are called complex bids. Um, and generally, the European system have simple bids. Some of them are sophisticated simple bids, but the, the structure is different to the, the structure we have. And I think you just have Generally, the bids must be of a, of a similar form, and this is one of the areas we're looking at changing. The other thing is that the timing of when the, the markets close and when the information is processed through the markets have to align uh, in order to get proper market coupling. So it's not impossible, um, but it, it's important that you know that, that the various pieces of work are done. I know that the, the Spanish and Italian markets are probably more pool-like markets, um, and they're certainly they're well advanced uh, to have. Um, you know the, the the day ahead market certainly um, coupled uh, by 2014. So th there's no fundamental impediment, um, but it, it does need to work. There's a lot of detail to work through. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I think we will uh, we will adjourn at this stage. Uh, it's always interesting interesting to keep changing on uh, these and uh, much more topics, but uh, we our time schedule is limited. Thank you very much, Garrett. Really interesting presentation today. Um, this will be published and certainly um, widely visualized by 
uh, by prof energy professionals and uh, quite soon energy regulators. Um, let's definitely be in touch for further cooperation. And well, at this stage, I will simply uh, give you the the floor to to close the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fernando. And I'd just like to say thanks to everyone uh, who participated and who've listened in. Um, uh, we appreciate it. Um, it's it's important, I suppose, as regulators that we feel that people can understand what it is we're trying to achieve and, and the various challenges we have in place. And I appreciate everyone staying and listening to the to the whole presentation. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you.